In the past 30 years, scientists have made an incredible discovery of a new creature living deep beneath the surface of the ocean. And the name of the creature is the harp sponge. Now, if you're wondering why it took so long to come across this animal, then I might have the answer. These creatures typically hang out at a depth of roughly 11,100 feet beneath the ocean's waves. This sponge species was first discovered off the coast of California thanks to a robot that was sturdy enough to explore those crazy depths the ocean has to offer. This is no doubt an area of the planet where even the most benign-looking creatures can be potentially dangerous. But even scientists were surprised to find that this creature was more than just a sponge. Now, this might seem obvious, but the harp sponge got its name because its basic structure, referred to as a vein, is the same shape as a harp. Each vein is made up of a horizontal branch supporting several parallel vertical branches. But don't let the harp sponge's fanciful and amusing appearance or its non-intimidating name fool you. Yeah, the harp sponge is very much a deep-sea hunter. It has a unique ability to capture and envelop small animals using its rhizoids, short, thin fibers. With their help, the harp sponge clings on to the soft, muddy bottom and catches tiny creatures that get swept into its branches by deep-sea currents. Uh-oh. Other sponge creatures often feed by pulling bacteria and bits of organic matter from the seawater and filtering them through their bodies. But not our harp sponge. Mm -mm. Instead, it snatches its future meal with minuscule barbed hooks that cover each of the harp sponge's branches. Now, harp sponges prefer tiny crustaceans like crabs, crayfish, shrimps, and prawns. Once the harp sponge has one of them in its clutches, it envelops the animal in a thin membrane before slowly beginning to digest it. So, pal, what's eating you? Oh, harpo? Too bad. Researchers believe that harp sponges use this method of feeding because there aren't enough nutrients that deep down. This makes traditional filter feeding less effective. Research has shown that the creature is still in the process of evolving. Early harp sponges researchers found only had two veins. But later, scientists discovered other harp sponges that had six veins. The harp sponge might have evolved this elaborate candle holder-like structure to increase its surface area. In general, harp sponges typically grow up to a length of one foot, but researchers have seen a creature that was two feet in length. The harp sponge is not wow. only very unusual, but also beautiful to look at. See those tiny white balls on top of the branches? Now, why don't we look at some other creatures that live below the photic zone of Earth's oceans? The photic zone means the area beneath the ocean's surface that still receives some sunlight. Thanks to this, there are loads of different creatures and organisms living there. Any animal living beyond this layer qualifies as a deep-sea creature. The Tomopterus worm is a segmented worm you can find in the twilight zone of the ocean. This is the area that lies between 650 and 3,300 feet beneath the surface. These creatures are often no more than one inch long, but the largest of them can grow up to one foot. While swimming around and feeding, these worms do what researchers describe as an amazing smooth dance. That's because the creatures can swim extremely quickly and maneuver at tight angles with ease. Now, I know most people hear the word worm and think of the common earthworm. So it's quite interesting to know there's a deep sea worm out there that never leaves the water during its entire life. Similarly, most of us try to avoid jellyfish that either rest on the sand or sit on top of the ocean waves. This isn't the case with a Crisota jelly. That's a deep sea creature, too. This beautiful jellyfish is mostly ruby red, bright orange, or electric purple. That's what helped researchers realize they had found a new species of jellyfish. The creature grows to a maximum size of one inch across. It has tentacles that stretch out in every direction. Now, if you come close to this jellyfish, it'll pull all these tentacles in toward its body before rapidly swimming away to avoid danger. Yes, you are dangerous. The chrysota jelly is extremely rare. You won't see it very often. You might need to borrow that deep-sea diving robot I mentioned earlier. While worms and jellyfish might seem quite harmless, this isn't the case with the Pacific viperfish. Ooh. This creature is equipped with a noticeably big mouth, like me. And the needle-like teeth inside are key to its hunting strategy. Pacific viperfish live at around 5,000 feet below the ocean surface. 
but they're among those numerous marine animals that migrate each night from the ocean depths toward shallower waters to dine. What's on the menu for dinner tonight? Hmm, lots of small fish and shrimp. The creature can grow up to 12 inches in length. Its two front fangs, which stick up from the fish's bottom jaw past its own eyes, are especially dramatic. When the fish unhinges its jaw, its mouth can open wide enough to engulf smaller animals, and the teeth form a cage to prevent an escape. Now, have you ever seen an underwater creature that looks like a strawberry? Trust me, it does exist. Just look at these dots on the strawberry squid. The creature has a big eye and a smaller one. You might think this unconventional pairing would be awkward and uncomfortable, but it's actually the opposite. The big left eye looks upward. It spots shadows cast by other animals in the dimly lit waters above. The eye's tubular shape helps it collect as much light as possible. On the other side of the squid's head, you can see its right eye. It's small and looks downward. This eye searches for flashes of bioluminescence produced by animals lurking in the darker waters below. Now, bioluminescence means the production and emission of light by living organisms. By the way, the squid has a nickname. And no, it's not squiggy, although that's a great one. It's known as the cockeyed squid. This is simply due to the remarkable difference in size between its two eyes. Hmm, I think I like squiggy better. And so it goes. Since light doesn't reach the deep sea, the strawberry squid's body actually looks black. This helps the creature hide from enemies, such as sharks and dolphins. In general, the strawberry squid grows to a length of 5 inches. It typically lives around 3,000 feet below the surface, but floats to shallower waters at night. Now, the feather star is a marine creature without a backbone, but with feather-like arms that radiate from the center of its body. These creatures first appeared around 200 million years ago. Related to sea stars, they look like a flower, but if you approach them, they'll quickly swim away. But not all feather stars can swim. Many species can only crawl along the bottom of the seafloor. Like some of the other deep-sea creatures we've looked at, the feather star can adapt to its surroundings. It has a creepy ability to shed its arms, the same way some lizards can shed their tails. This also helps them escape from their enemies. Feather stars live all across the globe, from the equator to the poles, from the shallow waters on top of reefs to the deep, deep sea. Now, given that we're dealing with mysterious creatures, the name of this one is quite fitting. The swift vampire squid should be the official symbol of life in the deep sea. The animal has a dark red body, huge blue eyes, and a cloak-like web that stretches between its eight arms. This, along with its name, may suggest that the creature is some form of a terrifying hunter. In reality, though, the vampire squid is a soft-bodied, timid creature about the size, shape, and color of a football. It grows to roughly 12 inches in length and lives 3,000 feet below the waves. There's almost no oxygen there, but also relatively few predators. I think I'll need to decompress from this one. If you could dive right into the mysterious darkness of the ocean depths, who knows what you'd come upon? Legends that are hundreds of years old mention some giant sea monsters hiding deep down below the ocean waves, like the Kraken, the Loch Ness Monster, the Hydra, Leviathan, and so many more. Okay, no one has ever seen such monsters, but there are still weird and unusually big sea spiders, squid, worms, and many other animals that grew way more than we'd expected. Take a look at the colossal squid from sub-Antarctic waters. It's around 14 times longer than the arrow squid that lives near New Zealand. And deep down in the Pacific Ocean, there's a sea sponge as big as a minivan. Oceans contain about 96.5% of all water on our planet. Up to 80% of all life on Earth we've discovered is under the oceanic waves. We haven't explored, mapped, or even seen more than 80% of the ocean. In fact, we've mapped Mars better than we have the ocean bottom. The pressure down there is insane, and it would make you feel like you're holding up almost 50 jumbo jets. And temperatures at such depths are extremely low. Conditions deep below the oceanic surface are harsh. 
So, creatures that live there need to adjust. That's why many of them grew very, very big to survive. Creatures that live in cold, dark depths are so big because of a phenomenon called deep sea gigantism. The deeper you go below the oceanic surface, the less sunlight there is. That's why the temperatures drastically fall. The result of this is increased cell size and longer life of creatures. Also, these creatures don't have as much oxygen as the marine animals that live in shallower parts. And their food sources are minimal. Much of the food they get comes from shallower waters, and only a little bit trickles down to the deeper parts. And when there's not enough food, being large is an advantage. Larger creatures can move farther and faster to find something to eat. Their metabolism works slower. They don't digest the food that fast, so they can store food and conserve energy for hard times when they can't find anything to eat. They don't need to regulate their body temperature either, which also helps them save some energy, which they can then transfer to other body processes. They mature more slowly and later than those living in shallow waters. The majority of fish species that dwell in deep waters live 30 years or even more. Orange roughy fish, on the other hand, live up to 150 years. This fella grows 24 feet in length and weighs up to 1.5 tons. But it grows to be so big for centuries. They start looking for partners when they're 150 years old. And they can also live this long because there are not so many predators at such depths. Also, there are no humans or other things that can disturb them or endanger their existence. At such depths, the environment is pretty stable. So many animals there are like living fossils because they probably haven't changed in millions of years. The first 650 feet of the ocean's depth are considered to be the open ocean. The majority of the marine life we've discovered lives there since that's the area the sun can still reach. And then, as you continue going deeper, you reach the twilight zone. It seems like nothing lives there. But at about 820 feet, you see a small oasis of ancient life blooming. For example, there are sea lilies, animals that have been living at such depths unchanged for millions of years. Coelacanths, another living fossil, have been living in the ocean for more than 360 million years. Hagfish haven't changed in a very long time either, for over 300 million years. This creature lives at depths of 5,500 feet. They evolved before the rest of the vertebrates, which is why this is the only living animal without jaws or a spine, even though it still has a skull. Deep sea creatures can't survive in shallow waters. They've evolved to live in depths under bigger hydrostatic pressure. Humans and other organisms that have internal spaces filled with gas would end up crushed if we could go to such depths. That's why deep sea divers always need to wear special dive suits designed for surroundings with higher pressure, even though they're not going that deep to the areas where these giants live. But near Antarctica, you can see gigantism way closer to the surface, like giant sponges, sea slugs, sea spiders the size of a dinner plate, worms, and even some enormous single-celled organisms. They all tend to chill in shallower waters. Scientists are not sure why exactly, but they think it could have something to do with oxygen. Giant species use just a little oxygen, and the waters around Antarctica are pretty rich in it which means there's hardly any limit to these animals growing bigger and bigger. Back to deep sea creatures. As mentioned, they had to adjust to strong pressure, so they almost don't have any air gaps in their body at all. They're mostly water-based, and since water is incompressible, which means it's not something you can compress, it helps them stay unaffected at such high pressure. But because of all that, if they were to go up towards the surface, they'd probably swell up, maybe even explode. Just look at the blobfish, the one that takes the title of the ugliest animal in the world. It looks normal deep down below the surface, where its natural habitat is. But when it gets up to the surface, where the pressure is 120 times lower, it changes its shape. The blobfish doesn't have a skeleton or muscles, 
So, without high deep sea pressure, it ends up being all floppy and saggy. The dark oceanic depths are not just scary to watch, but to listen to as well. In 1997, scientists were trying to find underwater volcanoes located off the South American coast. During their travels, they recorded one of the loudest noises ever registered. It was pretty weird, too. It was so loud, even sensors from more than 3,000 miles away managed to pick it up. They later called it the bloop. It took them 15 years to conclude the sound came from an ice quake. That's when seismic activity breaks frozen ground. Water at the bottom of the ocean is not always extremely cold. There are hydrothermal vents on the seafloor, and the water that comes out of them can be up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Powerful pressure, yep, the same one that would crush you, is something that doesn't allow the water to boil. There are hundreds of animal species that live near deep sea hydrothermal vents. Some of them, such as tube worms, are not like anything we've seen before. These worms absorb chemicals from vent fluids. That's how they feed bacteria that live in them. And in return, those bacteria give them the carbon the tube worms need to survive. Two thirds of all of the coral species scientists discovered live in dark, deep, and extremely cold parts of the ocean. Some even live in parts that are three miles deep. They can survive at low temperatures, such as 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of these cold water corals are more than 8,000 years old. They form amazing structures that can rise up to 115 feet tall. The deep is not just a mysterious world of unusual creatures. The landscape under the oceanic surface is magnificent too. The canyons hiding there make even the Grand Canyon seem small. For instance, check out the one located in the Bering Sea, the Zhem Chug Canyon. Its vertical relief is more than 8,500 feet deep. That's huge. The largest ocean waves are not the ones you can see from the shoreline. They occur under the surface, and they're called internal waves. They take place between two water masses that have different densities. They travel at speeds of thousands of miles per hour and can be 650 feet tall. Jupiter, the fastest spinning planet in our solar system, with a day lasting only 10 hours. The biggest planet in our solar system, a gas giant more than 300 times as massive as Earth. It has rings of dust and colorful bands stretching across its surface, which are actually gases. And then there's the Great Red Spot, Iconic raging storm, huge hurricane, two to three times as wide as the whole Earth. It's also insanely deep and goes around 300 miles into Jupiter's atmosphere. That's 40 times as deep as the Mariana Trench, the deepest oceanic spot on Earth. Way more extensive than scientists expected. Researchers have speculated about the Great Red Spot for hundreds of years already. This storm is circling Jupiter in its southern hemisphere. At the center of this giant spinning storm, the winds are relatively calm. On the edges, wind speeds go up to 425 miles per hour. That's twice as faster than the strongest hurricanes on our planet, 175 miles per hour. When there's a hurricane on Earth, it goes wild at first, but eventually starts to slow down. It finally breaks apart when it reaches solid land. Jupiter has a sky that's 44 miles deep. There are layers of clouds, and beneath them, scientists believe, lies an ocean of liquid hydrogen. The planet's core is supposed to be right under that ocean, but we're still not sure what exactly it's made of. As far as we know, Jupiter is a gas world, so there's no solid ground that would stop the storm. That's why the spot continues to rage on and on. Scientists realize the storm is constantly changing its size. Compared to data from 1850, it's shrinking right now. The Great Red Spot used to be three times the size of Earth. It's been a long time since it last got bigger. As it's shrinking, the storm gets taller and changes color into an intense orange, possibly because of the chemical reactions. New matter raises from the bottom of the storm. The Red Great Spot could continue shrinking and eventually disappear in the next 10 to 20 years. But there could be another similar storm emerging somewhere else on Jupiter, if the Red Great Spot ever ends. This storm might seem very deep, but it's still shallower than the giant jets of wind that rage around it and power the storm even more. 
Jupiter's bands of wind go to depths of 2,000 miles below its cloud tops. Jupiter is generally known for having crazy windy conditions in the upper and lower parts of the atmosphere. The middle part is called the stratosphere, and we didn't know what was going on there. Scientists usually measure wind power by watching clouds, and there are no clouds in the stratosphere. But when a comet, Shoemaker Levy 9, collided with Jupiter in 1994, scientists got a chance to study cometary structure and composition and its effects on Jupiter's atmosphere. They discovered insanely strong winds in the stratosphere with speeds of 900 miles per hour. Jupiter isn't the only planet in our solar system with crazy weather. Mars has the biggest dust storms amongst all eight planets. When such a storm is raging, it seems like it creates a blanket over the entire planet that lasts for months. One theory that tries to explain why dust storms are so big on Mars says airborne particles of dust absorb sunlight and warm the planet's atmosphere. This creates warm pockets of air. They start flowing toward colder areas, which then generates winds. These winds lift dust off the ground, which heats the atmosphere, makes winds stronger, and kicks up more dust. Mars generally has a very thin atmosphere. It mostly consists of carbon dioxide, and the volume of gases in the Martian atmosphere is less than 1% of that of our planet. But Mars used to be much wetter and warmer than it is today. That means its atmosphere was much thicker a long time ago. It created a strong greenhouse effect and trapped the sunlight. Mars used to have a pretty strong magnetic field. Just like on Earth, the magnetic field on Mars was created by currents of molten metals in its core. But unlike our planet, the inside of Mars cooled enough to switch off the magnetic field. Without it, Mars wasn't protected from the solar wind. That's a powerful stream of particles flowing from our sun. It took only a couple of hundred million years, which is not much in space terms, for the solar wind to strip away most of the atmosphere on Mars. It went quickly because the sun used to rotate much faster at its earlier stages, so the solar wind was more powerful and energetic. And that's how Mars turned from a planet with a warm, wet climate into the cold, dry place it is today. Mars also has some interesting glaciers. They've been on its surface for hundreds of millions of years and can tell us secrets of the planet's past. For instance, that's how we found out Mars went through 6 to 20 separate ice ages during the past 300 to 800 million years. Satellites took images of 60,000 rocks of different sizes. They were distributed across the entire planet at random. If Mars had a single, long ice age, we'd find a progression of bigger to smaller rocks because they erode as time goes by. But the rocks were spread in clear bands of debris across the surface of these glaciers. Each band marked a different flow of ice, which means each of them formed during a different ice age. These glaciers are like time capsules because they could have all kinds of gases, rocks, or even microbes trapped inside. That means they could help us understand the changes in climate on Mars and tell us if there used to be any form of life on the planet. And the best thing, we don't need to drill deep down below the crust to find that out. Everything's on the surface. If you could go back in time, let's say 4 billion years, and visit the red planet, you'd probably see chaotic scenes of flooding. Scientists believe that mega flood happened because of a huge meteorotic impact. Because of the heat from that impact, ice on the planet's surface started melting. This flood carved out big ripples and waves in the sedimentary rock. Some wave-shaped features are over 30 feet high and spaced out 450 feet apart. Saturn also has its own unique weather conditions. Lightning bolts there can be 10,000 times more powerful than the ones we have on Earth. NASA's Cassini spacecraft was orbiting Saturn from 2004 to 2017. It captured lightning so strong and intense, we could see it even during the daytime. Cassini also recorded the sounds of those intense storms discharged into the planet's atmosphere. From time to time, Saturn has giant storms that go over 190,000 miles across the surface. They encircle nearly the entire planet. On Saturn's North Pole, there's a massive hexagon of clouds. It's a vortex of a pretty unusual shape that circulates hundreds of miles above the clouds and extends deep into the planet. But Saturn has its peaceful side, too. Along with Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, it has its own beautiful auroras from time to time. All four planets have an atmosphere dominated by hydrogen. That's why you can only see these auroras in ultraviolet wavelengths. These northern lights are especially bright at dusk and right before midnight. Venus has a giant storm swirling in the atmosphere at its south pole. The vortex is as big as the entirety of Europe, 
and it's probably been there for a very long time. The atmosphere on Venus moves 60 times faster than the planet rotates. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. Even the rain there offers no relief, since it's sulfuric acid falling from clouds and evaporating before it even gets to the ground. The sun also has its own angry outbursts in the shape of powerful solar storms. These storms bring strong radiation and dust particles that can cause serious damage to satellites that track the sun's activity to let us know if something goes wrong. Every now and then, a crazy solar storm can catch us off guard. About 160 years ago, a strong solar flare caused severe issues in global telegraph communications. About 30 years ago, a solar flare left 6 million people without electricity for 9 hours. One theory says strong solar activity could have caused the sinking of the Titanic. It happened on the same night as a fascinating northern light show. Some people believe a solar storm behind it had possibly disrupted the ship's communication systems and navigation, leading to one of the greatest unsolved mysteries ever.